this uh, presentation um, is called The Varieties of Psychoanalytic Listening. The clinical psychologist is an architect responsible for the creation of an environment in which a therapeutic conversation can take place. There are a number of ways of describing the basic psychoanalytic attitude and the parameters of the analytic dialogue. But the goal remains to make the unconscious conscious, to talk about what is difficult to talk about, to create the conditions for the patient to speak, and for the therapist to listen psychoanalytically, interpret, and bear witness. To listen, psychoanalytic, to listen psychoanalytically is to listen with free-floating attention, with neutrality, and without judgment. But beyond that, there are other varieties of psychoanalytic listening, and those are what I'd like to talk about with you today. I'd like to mention that after I finished writing this paper, I discovered a recently published book by Salman Akhtar entitled Psychoanalytic Listening, <laughs> Methods, Limits, and Innovations. In his first chapter, Akhtar noted that after Freud's recommendations on psychoanalytic listening in 1912, few analytic texts referred to the subject. And in a computer search for the term analytic listening in the PEP website, the 28 articles that appeared were all published since 1980. So it seems that an area of interest whose time, it seems to be an area of interest whose time has come. Not surprisingly, there is some overlap between my paper today and Akhtar's book. I highly recommend Akhtar's book, Psychoanalytic Listening, not only for the overlap with my work, but for the outstanding clinical vignettes and other areas he treated that I did not address. That said, let us begin. The basic idea is that psychological symptoms serve as caps that cover untold stories, and when the stories can be told in detail and with emotion, be examined and retold, sorted out, and have their affects liberated, it often, it, and if that can be done, it often has a curative effect. Imagine for a moment an anxious person having trouble breathing. The psychologist invites the patient to speak in a free and uncensored fashion in the confidence of the clinical situation. To this invitation, the patient tells his story, unburdens himself, cries and laughs. In the, con in the course of the conversation, the patient's story is punctuated with, you know, I've never told this to anyone. I don't know what you're going to think of me, but I'll say it anyway. I don't know why I am saying this. I had no idea I was going to talk about this. And at the end of the session, the patient breathes deeply, exhales fully, and says in a relieved tone of voice, Oh, I'm so glad I finally got that off my chest. This is a museum specimen of the analytic dialogue in which the symptom, difficulty breathing in this case, serves as a cap covering a story that must be told, and when it is told, the symptom is no longer needed. Of course, with most symptoms, it's a lot more complicated and requires more than one session, but the principle remains the same. Create the conditions for disclosure. This talk will find some uh, overlap with some of my other pieces. Um, this, this section I call Listening Like Bernfeld. Siegfried Bernfeld was among Freud's closest associates in Vienna. After his emigration to San Francisco in 1937, he wrote The Facts of Observation in Psychoanalysis. In it, he described psychoanalysis as a method of personal investigation based on the model of an ordinary conversation. <coughs> Bernfeld <coughs> noted that conversation is characterized by questions, revelations, overt communications, and subtexts, and that the analyst can, quote, transform the give and take of the conversation into an inquiry. 
The inquiry is to discover what gets in the way of the story that needs to be told. Thus, the facts of observation in psychoanalysis do not pertain to the content of the dreams, fantasies, or anamnesis, but rather to the shifts and changes in the analytic dialogue, specifically the resistances and transferences. Attending to the shifts and changes in the analytic dialogue, Bernfeld gave the example of how a listener closing a door can create the conditions of privacy that allow a person to say that which was previously difficult to disclose. Transposing this model onto the analytic relationship, Bernfeld suggested that just as the lack of privacy had been an external obstacle to self-disclosure, shame and distrust are internal obstacles which similarly require the therapist's skill to remove. Bernfeld emphasized that it is not the content of the patient's secret or confession to which the analyst should be attending, but rather the nature of the obstacle to disclosure, the nature of the resistance. If the analyst fails to note the resistance, he or she misses completely the opportunity of getting what Bernfeld called a confession. Here I quote Bernfeld. By saying the right things at the right time, the analyst creates the condition under which the patient is likely to confess secrets. These communications are the facts to be observed. To avoid confusion, it is useful to re regard Bernfeld's use of the term secret as referring to consciously and unconsciously held secrets, and to regard confession as referring to both revelation but also elaboration. Using the ordinary conversation as the model for the analytic dialogue, Bernfeld schematized the psychoanalytic dialogue in five phases, abbreviated as U S I C U. The patient engages in his usual U behavior or discourse. Under the analytic condition, of free association and the analyst's neutrality and confidentiality, the resistance naturally gets established and the patient begins to keep a secret, the S. The secret can be something the patient is fully aware of and yet consciously suppressing, or it can be a secret he keeps from his, himself under an arsenal of defensive strategies mobilized as resistances in the analytic hour. The analyst, seeing the patient's method of secreting or resisting, intervenes in the patient's discourse, interpreting, that's the I. The resistance, interpreting the resistance or demonstrating the resistance. If the interpretation is correct and is presented with good tact, Oops, this section again here about the USICU. It's a little formulation that Bernfeld is offering. Using the ordinary conversation as a model for the analytic dialogue, Bernfeld schematized the psychoanalytic dialogue in five phases abbreviated as USICU. The patient engages in his usual behavior or discourse, that's the U. Under the analytic conditions of free association and the analyst's neutrality and confidentiality, the resistance naturally gets established and the patient begins to keep a secret. That's the S. The secret can be something the patient is fully aware of and yet consciously suppressing, or it can be a secret he keeps from himself under an arsenal of defensive strategies mobilized as resistances in the analytic hour. The analyst, seeing the patient's method of secreting or resisting, intervenes in the patient's discourse by interpreting, that's the I, interpreting the resistance or demonstrating the resistance. If the interpretation is correct and is presented with good timing and tact, the patient confesses, that's the C, confesses the secret or elaborates it and then returns to the usual discourse. Bernfeld's model 
U-S-I-C-U, enables us to follow the psychoanalytic dialogue, evaluate the accuracy of interpretation, keep our eye on the resistance, and avoid making the stimulus error, that is, getting caught in the content. Another advantage to this model is that in facilitating the analyst's focus on the analytic dialogue, the analyst is less likely to impose preformed theoretical assumptions on the patient and more likely to listen to the material as it emerges, allowing the patient to say what needs to be said and possibly even overhear himself saying it. Bernfeld said, psychoanalysis is a Spurendiesenschaft, a science of traces. One finds the traces of the unconscious imposed upon the free associations. Detecting the traces in language, we locate ourselves in the process by hearing the manifest content as derivative of the transference, the genetic, and the intercurrent, or between sessions, material. Decoding the traces enables the analyst to identify the resistance and offer a well-placed interpretation in the flow of the analytic dialogue. Bernfeld helps us in those difficult moments in our work by inviting us to wonder what is my patient saying what is my patient saying and how is he or she saying it and more than that how is my patient not saying something that needs to be said when we ask how is the patient not saying something we are asking what resistances are being deployed and what is the nature of the transference Theodore Reich wrote, The psychoanalyst has to learn how one mind speaks to another beyond words and in silence. He must learn to listen with the third ear. Listening to the resistances, transferences, and the repetition compulsion. Psychoanalytic work begins with the notion that the psyche, like an ock iceberg, is comprised of a small conscious portion above water, a ribbon of pre-consciousness at the water line, and a vast unconscious portion underwater, so to speak. Consciousness refers to that which is in our awareness, directed attention, etc. The pre-conscious is not fully in consciousness, but can be summoned up at will, or noticed suddenly, while never having been completely unconscious. The unconscious portion is inferred from various conscious experiences that give us the sense that something outside our awareness is operating, driving our moods and behavior, shaping our dreams and fantasies, our slips of tongue, our passions, and our psychological symptoms. With the notion that behavior is motivated by impulses and ideas of which we are unaware, that is, lying hidden in the unconscious, we say that psychotherapy is about making the unconscious conscious or learning to keep as few secrets from oneself as possible. Between the conscious and pre-conscious are some rather flexible defensive strategies which permit the passage of information from pre-conscious into consciousness and vice versa. Between the pre-conscious and the unconscious are some much stronger defensive strategies which block the passage of information from unconsciousness into awareness. The clinical approach of Freud's early id psychology focused on examining the manifest content of the dream, slip, free association, etc., and interpreting its latent or unconscious meaning. The clinical approach of his later ego psychology focused on first interpreting the resistances to become conscious of what was unconscious and only then shifting to the interpretation of the latent meaning. Some will ask, why are you being so defensive? As if one were somehow supposed to get rid of one's defenses. But a person without defense defenses is either unconscious or dead. We all need our defenses, if nothing else, simply to be conscious. And while everyone has defenses, no two people have the same defensive constellation. The defenses are tools, and while everyone has a toolkit of defenses, every toolkit is unique. 
Typical defenses include things like projection, intellectualization, denial and fantasy, humor negation, splitting, reaction formation, suppression, projective identification, and so on. Each person has a preferred set of defenses and deploys those defenses in different ways and with, different, uh, and with varying levels of flexibility. Under stress, the defensive constellation, that defensive toolkit, enlists different tools to meet the challenges presented. A person that is described as defensive is not just deploying defenses, but deploying more defenses than appear to be necessary. In such circumstances, we become curious about the story beneath the hyperdefense or symptom and seek to interpret the defense in a way that allows the patient to let the defense down and speak freely about that which is difficult to put into words. As a point of clarification, there's a difference between defense and resistance. Defenses are constantly being deployed by the psyche, but when the defenses are deployed in therapy, before the invitation to speak in a free and uncensored fashion, we call them resistances. In short, resistances are resistances to speak in, free, in a free and uncensored fashion. Everyone resists, but we all resist in different ways, and the way we resist conceals our unique untold stories. Yes, we sometimes speak of the interpretation of de defense, but all interpretations of defense in psychotherapy are interpretations of resistance. That said, the resistances include more than just defenses. Defenses do not stand by themselves. They form part of the structure of the psyche, along with object relations, uh, uh, along with object relations. These object relations are the internal representations of parents, siblings, and other important figures of early childhood with whom one engages in early love relations and in the vicissitudes of libido development. When, for example, a patient's paternal object relation, internal image, imago, engram, etc., is projected onto the person of the therapist under the conditions of confidentiality, neutrality, and the invitation to free associate, we call that projection a transference. As the patient has transferred the early childhood object relation, the internal representation, onto the person of the therapist. When a patient has the same sorts of authority problems, year after year gets involved in romantic relations that always fail in the same fashion, keeps engaging in self-sabotage, has curiously similar problems with most of his or her friends, runs into the same sorts of recurring problems with money or with time, we are witnessing not simply defenses or transferences, but defenses and object relations in a dy dynamic constellation we call the repetition compulsion. The repetition compulsion is the compulsion to repeat early childhood trauma in the form of scenarios relying on contemporary circumstances, on present day stages, uh, on present day stages and with actors in the patient's everyday life. A wife becomes a familiar mother in a resuscitated early childhood drama. A boss becomes a familiar father in a revived adolescent rebellion. And as long as the trauma remains sufficiently buried, the drama continues. The repetition compulsion is a contemporary version of the drama that is analogically related to a childhood trauma. The contemporary drama, which the person feels compelled to repeat, has the function of concealing the original trauma. The drama conceals the trauma. To listen to the transference is to listen to whom it is the patient directs his discourse. A punishing other, a critical other, a betraying other, an abandoning other, an absent other, a loving other. To listen to the repetition compulsion is to listen to the scenario of the drama that the patient is seducing us to enter, recruiting us to live out, auditioning us to act out. The patient does not simply want to have a particular kind of relationship with us, 
but actually is the relationship, looking for an other with whom to play out the scenario. When I say it is the relationship, I'm saying that the patient is both sides of that drama, or it might have three sides to that drama. And the person is all three roles. They might prefer one role. Or if it's two roles, they might prefer one role. But if the situation changes, they can reverse roles. So the person is the relationship. Looking for an other with whom to play out the scenario. And if we do not fulfill our assigned role, the patient will often try to reverse roles with us. If we don't criticize the patient, for example, the patient may criticize us. The patient is, in a sense, an experience looking for an event, an angry person looking for something to be angry about, a failure looking for something to fail, to, to fail at, a saboteur looking for someone to sabotage, an abandonment looking for someone to leave, a betrayal waiting to happen, and so on. As therapists, we want to listen to whom the patient directs his or her dis discourse and listen to the scenario of the drama, within and the drama without. If we don't act out and can interpret what is going on, we have the opportunity to make the unconscious a bit more conscious. Listening to yourself. As our patients speak to us, we listen to what they are saying, how they are saying it, and how they are not saying something. But we also listen to ourselves in therapy. We listen to the thoughts that appear and pass through across the stage of our mental theater. We become aware of thoughts that are engaging, stimulating, judgmental, hostile, confused, excited, amused, and so on. We feel ourselves falling into positions and stances in relation to what is being said. Our body feels comfortable, uncomfortable, energized, heavy. We feel sad, proud, envious, hurt, sleepy, frightened, absent-minded, jealous, competitive, hurt, overlooked, ignored, or angry. <coughs> our mind sometimes becomes foggy. We think about something in our personal life. We get lost in a memory or lapse into a fantasy. Within the analytic context, these are experiences we describe as countertransference. When listening to the countertransference, the therapist wants to distinguish when the countertransference tells him or her mostly about the therapist and when it seems to say more about the patient. If the patient touches one of the therapist's personal conflicts, the countertransference is going to tell the therapist about the therapist. But when the patient has managed to export an object relation into the therapist, transfer an important figure from early childhood onto the therapist, has managed to engage the therapist in the patient's repetition compulsion, the therapist's countertransference ends up being information useful in understanding the patient. The countertransference always tells us either a bit about the patient and a lot about the therapist, or a lot about the patient and only a bit about the therapist. When we listen to the countertransference, we are listening to our thoughts and feelings, fantasies and, association, and, and associations as information, telling us something about what is going on between the patient and the therapist. Hostile or erotic fantasies can, for example, tell us something about the nature of the ther psychotherapeutic relation when interpreted analogically. Countertransference fatigue is a common problem and is sometimes associated with a patient that is trying hard not to say something, or a therapist that is resisting hearing some aspect of what the patient is trying to say. Resistance is sometimes diminished and the narrative opened up by the therapist saying, I wonder how you're feeling talking about this with me today. Such an intervention brings the patient into the moment and frequently revives the narrative. And of course, there are other interventions as well. I remember saying this to a patient. I found myself, the content of what the patient was saying was absolutely fascinating, but I was far from fascinated. I, I, I felt somehow numb and deadened. And I said to the patient, I said, uh, I wonder uh, how you're feeling talking about this with me today. The patient said, I feel completely bored. Just, <laughs> right? And then, then sort of returned to a much more 
engaged uh, conversation. Um, that there, there was some way in which the, the, the patient was falling into a, creating a kind of a deadening uh, in our conversation and basically avoiding uh, talking about what was really happening. Every countertransference fantasy contains a ratio of narcissistic and object-related components. The more narcissistic the ratio, the more it has to do with the psychotherapist and his or her personal psychology. The more object-related the ratio, the more the therapist's fantasy has to do with the patient and his or her psychology. As an example, I once had a persistent countertransference fantasy of I once had persistent countertransference fantasies uh, of conducting cosmetic surgery on a young man's face. No other patient before or since has ever evoked such fantasies. I didn't know what to make of them, but observed their persistence and listened session after session. The patient was a somewhat plain-looking young man who always left his hair just a little, uh, a little bit uncombed. On anyone else, I might have seen it as an artsy style and not given it much more thought. But with him, I found myself often desperately wanting to reach forward and comb his hair back. <laughs> then one day, he explained that his father was well known for being very good looking, well groomed and impeccably dressed. And he was also always invasively trying to fix up the patient and make him look more like the father. Suddenly, my countertransference fantasies took on uh, more sense for me. With a somewhat obsessive woman patient, I found myself often sleepy as she recounted details of stories about which there never seemed to be feelings or even much of a point. One day, I suddenly dropped into a fantasy which was the reliving of an adolescent memory. The memory was of being at a summer camp, playing water polo in the pool with a watermelon, which will float in the water, and it was covered with Crisco. This was something we did at summer camp. We did play water polo with the, the big watermelon. Great fun. When I came out of this memory, I wonder why I had fallen so deeply into that particular adolescent memory, and concluded it to have something to do with what I was hearing from my patient. The feature most prominent for me was the slippery watermelon. I said to my patient, you know, I'm having trouble getting a grasp on what you're saying today. Your story seems somehow slippery. Uh, and uh, uh, her eyes popped open and she began to speak with great feeling about how important the word slippery was to her and how being slippery has been a survival strategy most of her life. My countertransference fatigue, of course, disappeared immediately, and the previously blocked associations began flowing once again. Listening to the narrative and reading the subtitles. Another mode of listening is to hear the three narratives of whatever is being said. The three narratives are the intercurrent, the transferential, and the early childhood memories. The intercurrent narrative is about what's been happening between sessions, events, dreams, thoughts, relationships. The transferential narrative is about the patient's relation to the therapist. And the early childhood narrative is about the emotionally charged experiences from early childhood. The idea is that as the patient speaks about intercurrent, transferential, or early childhood experiences, we are in a position to put two sets of imaginary subtitles under everything that is said in order to listen to the manifest story analogically and obtain two latent subtexts. The subtext we'll read, we read will always be suppositional, intuitive, and subject to counter-transference. So we need to regard them as hunches, mindful that they will also arrive with a mix of narcissistic and object-related components. The patient may enter the office and say, Hey, how about those Seahawks? You know, the football team. The transferential subtitle might read, I'm afraid of you, so I will try to join with you in the pleasure of our football team winning a competition, and in that way stay out of competition with you. <laughs> 
the early childhood subtitle might read, I managed my Oedipal rivalry by identifying with my father and watching the game with him. But he always scared me, and I always wanted to beat him. So I'm going to try to beat you at your game and distract you from our analytic relationship with the comments about the football game. I will in that way win and lose by defeating you at your own game. The patient may say, no, I just don't feel like you're understanding me. The intercurrent subtitle might read, I'm not feeling understood these days by my wife or my boss. The early childhood subtitle might read, my mother and father never understood me because I didn't talk and I found safety in not being understood by them. The patient may say, my grandfather always touched me in such a prideful and respectful way. The intercurrent subtitle might read, things are going well with my new boyfriend. The transferential subtitle might read, you are listening to me the way my grandfather touched me, sensitively, not the way my father touched me. We use the subtitles or subtext to hear the patient, uh, I'm sorry, we use the subtitles or subtext to hear what the patient is trying to tell us, to elaborate in metaphor the patient's response to an interpretation, or to create additional space to help the patient hear him or herself. To listen to the subtext is to listen analogically in relation to these three narratives. Listening to metaphor. To speak with a patient in concrete terms is to see him or her as monadic and univocal, one voice. The monadic person is a unitary being, a discrete individual, an encapsulated identity. It is a useful way to see oneself and to see others, but it is an, illu and it is an illusion, a sometimes useful illusion. The monadic person is a rational, willful agent of his or her destiny. A patient, a consumer, a voter, an effective person in the world. But if truth be told, we are not unitary, but interactional. We are not discrete, but intersubjective. And our identities are comprised of identifications. We may have only one mouth and strive for personal consistency, but we are not inherently univocal, speaking in one voice. We are polyvocal. We speak in many voices. We are in acting in response to many voices, many messages that we have obtained from often early childhood experiences and other important experiences. We speak in many voices. We each speak in the name of our mother, our father, our siblings. We speak in the name of our teachers, our fears, our hopes, our critical voices, our impulsive demands, and even in the name of our child selves. The monadic and univocal discourse is concrete. The composite and polyvocal discourse is fluid, changing, and metaphorical. The mouth is an anatomical structure, but through the symbolic function, it gets metaphorized into, world, into a world of oral symbols through which we convey orality. The same holds for anality, oedipality, genitality, and so on. We listen for the metaphors of infantile sexuality in derivative material, dreams, fantasies, art, and relationship dynamics. We hear psychological dynamics in the metaphors of religious, political, or philosophical concerns. Our hobbies, favorite films and books, special interests, and so on. We construct ourselves with metaphors, are imprisoned by the metaphors we use, and in therapy, interpretations in the form of metaphors loosen resistances and afford us new possibilities of being. Listening to what the patient is hearing. When we listen to the metaphors and subtexts of the patient's narratives, we hear an ongoing commentary on how the patient is hearing what is going on in the session. This allows us to evaluate if we are being effective in helping the patient to say what is difficult to say 
or if our treatment is fortifying defenses and blockading the processes. An elderly woman said, quote, Now that my husband has died, I don't feel like going out much, and I'm spending a lot of time at home alone. I listened and replied, Yes, it must be very painful to have lost your husband, but I think it'll be important to also find a way to get out from time to time. She replied, Yes, and I'm so irritated with my children because they don't understand me at all when I want to stay at home and they are always trying to get me to do things and right now I just don't want to. I just want to stay at home for now. And to which I replied, Yes, and you get irritated with me as well when I encourage you to get out. She smiled, giggled, and said, Yes, thank you. <laughs> Related to hearing, uh, listening to the patient's theory of personality. Related to hearing what the patient is hearing, is hearing the patient's theory of personality. It is sometimes useful to ask the patient quite directly about how the symptoms came to be, and if the patient has any ideas how therapy can be useful. Beyond that, it may be useful to explain how we think about therapy and how it works. If we can't hear the patient's implicit or explicit theory of personality and therapeutic change, we don't if we can't hear the patient's implicit or explicit theory of personality and therapeutic change, and we don't explain or clearly demonstrate how we work, the patient is likely to fall back on standard, concrete expectations associated with a wide variety of other services in the health professions, in which the patient shows up, the professional does something to them, or gives something to relieve suffering. In psychotherapy, many patients await medication, advice, a stern lecture, punishment, absolution, or whatever else might be in their imagination. Without being inducted into the analytic dialogue, some patients will hear an interpretation as a criticism, or think that when the therapist speaks of an unconscious desire, it is a conscious desire, and they will simply deny it. We have to help them to understand what it is we're saying and how we're saying it and to, to what end. When we listen to what the patient is hearing and how the patient is hearing, what the, to what the patient is hearing and how the patient is hearing, we're in a better position to hear the echoes of our interpretations, track the process, and thereby stay empathically closer to the patient. But some psychotherapists are more interested in their own theory than in the patient's theory. In these circumstances, an otherwise good theory can be used as a filter or cookie cutter to impose upon the patient, obscure the therapist's view of the patient, and limit what the therapist would otherwise be capable of hearing. A good theory, like a good lens, helps us to see things that are so not so readily apparent. But we make an error when we think our theory is the true reality. That is why it is useful to be able to see the patient through the patient's lens to understand and empathize with the patient, and then see the patient through multiple theoretical lenses, employing critical thinking to determine the theory or theories that offer the greatest explanatory power and treatment implications. One of the biggest errors a therapist can make is to over-identify with a particular theoretical orientation to such an extent that the therapist is simply scanning the patient's narrative for data related to the preferred theory. When the therapist can only think of the patient in relation to a single theory, the patient may be in danger of being clinically abandoned. This is a religious attitude, and it does not do justice to a good theory. Listening to words, listening to the words, Sometimes it is useful to listen to what the patient intends to say, and sometimes it is useful to listen to what the patient actually says. The words the patient actually uses and the way the sentences are constructed. In other words, the patient the words the patient uses in the in the words the patient uses, we can hear slips of the tongue and see the way language constructs narrative. 
subjectivity, and otherness. In the use of words, we can hear the way a patient speaks as if we are stupid, critical, dangerous, all-knowing, benevolent, friendly, and so on. The use of words constructs subjectivity and otherness, and it is in this way that we recognize the transference and the resistances. The depressive, for example, speaks of things happening and of waiting and being powerless to affect change. The hysteric also feels powerless but provokes others to action and moves only when the spirit moves them. The person lacking psychological insight speaks concretely, logically, abstractly, and intellectually and has trouble thinking metaphorically, figuratively, analogically and integrating emotion. A good copy editor reads the text and helps the writer to say what he or she is trying to say. A good therapist listens to the narrative and helps the patient to speak about that which is difficult to say. The repressed or suppressed may be difficult to speak about because it is painful, conflictual, embarrassing, sublime, or some secret pleasure. But the therapist listens to the words and offers the patient the opportunity to open up the narrative and elaborate the story. The way listening shapes the narrative. Errors in listening are made when we are too concrete in our understanding or interpretation of the narrative. When we are too metaphorical and miss the affect in the concrete telling of the story, when we are stuck in our preferred theory and can't hear anything outside of it, when we reduce every narrative to the infantile sexual metaphor, or the religious metaphor, or the interpersonal metaphor, or the transference metaphor, or the sexual and aggressive metaphors, or when we miss the multiple interpretations of the narrative, the error comes when we only have one way of listening. We need multiple modes of psychoanalytic listening and critical thinking to evaluate and deploy them. Cri clinical thinking is critical thinking in the clinical context. Many psychologists have a tendency to overlook substance abuse and the physical basis of psychological problems. Other psychologists listen only to themes that interest them and leave patients with other issues unheard. The way that we listen and respond to the narrative gives the patient information that tells him or her how we are listening and what we like hearing and don't like hearing. These cues shape the story that is being told and in this way limit or canalize the narrative. A judgmental scowl will limit what the patient has to say. A competitive rebuttal may shut one down. An understanding nod might encourage one to keep going. A silent reply might rupture rapport and derail the therapeutic alliance, or conversely, initiate the analytic dialogue into greater depth. It is in this sense that the way we listen shapes the narrative. We sometimes hear it said that patients of Jungian analysts have Jungian dreams, and patients of Freudian analysts have Freudian dreams. Patients often tell us only what we want to hear. Listening for something you've never heard before. I once had the rare opportunity to enter the original cave at Lascaux in southern France to see the 17,000-year-old Paleolithic cave paintings. As a small group of us shuffled slowly along a path through the dark, we were asked to stop at various points when lights would be turned on briefly to reveal the cave paintings. The tour was presented in French, and one of the archaeology grad students, who had been in the cave before, translated for me. As we neared her favorite image, she leaned close in the dark and whispered, Now get ready to be surprised. Other than the suggestion to listen, I cannot imagine better advice for the psychotherapist. Get ready to be surprised. I once heard a musicologist describing the height of music appreciation as listening to a piece of music 
you have never you you have heard many times before without anticipating the next note. Sometimes while preparing to see my next patient, I'll have a thought refreshing my memory about the current issues being dealt with in therapy. I then scold myself gently for anticipating the next session and invite myself to listen more openly so as to hear something I've never heard before. In short, I think it's a good idea to listen to the familiar narrative, hear something you've never heard before, and get ready to be surprised.